Skylanders, Disney Infinity, Lego Dimensions. If, like me, you were a kid in the early to mid 2010s, you likely would have played one or more of these. Heck, it was practically what my channel lived off of for the longest time. Toys to Life games revolutionised gaming for a new generation of kids, but the wave turned out to be quite short lived. Which begs the question why did Toys to Life, as a genre, die? We'll start with the trendsetter, Skylanders. The first game, Skylanders Spyro's Adventure, launched in October 2011 to widespread acclaim. Starting life as just another Spyro game, developer Toys for Bob didn't like the mature direction originally intended for the game, so they decided to aim it at more of a kid-friendly audience. This was great for developer Paul Reiki, who in the meantime had been drawing out a concept on how to integrate toys and gaming for a while. Clearly, he had much success, since the game would release a sequel a year later called Skylanders Giants. In my opinion, this was the best game of the Skylanders franchise, but this isn't about how good it was, but why it failed. And here's where we hit our first roadblock. In 2013, Skylanders brought out its third instalment in Skylanders Swap Force, which for me is where things started to go downhill. Firstly, let's talk about the Dark Edition. The concept of different coloured variants of Skylanders was not a new thing, nor was bringing out different starter packs, but the Dark Edition was a joke. They charged £80 for you to have 5 Skylanders coloured in the Dark variant that we all came to know and love. Fine, but Skylanders were charging way too much. Too many people decided to save their money or even take to eBay instead, which left profit margins in the dirt. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. The real problem was that the game was radically different to anything previously experienced. The camera was zoomed out way too far, so you could barely see your own character, which also insulted Dark Edition buyers. On top of this, the control scheme was changed to a much more complicated layout which was hard to adjust to. At this point, players like me switched to other Toys to Life franchises, but we'll get onto that. However, it did seem that a new generation of Skylanders players came in at this point. Magically, Skylanders managed to get another three yearly releases after this, and even a team up with Amiibo. Not bad. Whilst its last release was in 2016, the Skylanders franchise is technically still alive and kicking today, in the form of a mobile game released in 2018 called Ring of Heroes. But why haven't we seen a main console release in five years? Well, there isn't a definitive answer on this from Activision, but there are multiple articles explaining why. As it turns out, the closure of Toys R Us, Skylanders partner for exclusive figures, in 2017 might have been a trigger. However, it has also been suggested that Skylanders was actually a victim of its own success. Every year, over 30 figures would be released, which was a major investment from players, and it proved to be too much to ask. On top of this, Commentators suggest that the competition for shelf space from other games, despite their lesser success, also caused its demise as sales shrunk for the genre as a whole. It's an interesting case of a whole industry causing mutually assured destruction, largely just by existing. My personal favourite, Disney Infinity, launched two years after the first Skylanders in 2013. This mainly had a focus on the Pixar franchises, but like Skylanders, the game also went down the route of yearly releases. But Infinity offered something that Skylanders didn't. Online. You see, in Disney Infinity, you could build your own world with your friends and play together, although this wasn't the case for the in-house playsets. On top of this, each character unlocked something to use in the toy box from its franchise, incentivising players to actually collect them all. From Disney Infinity 2.0 onwards, you could play as very mainstream characters from the Marvel franchise, and even from Star Wars from the release of Disney Infinity 3.0. In fact, there is footage out there of the next instalment, 4.0, almost ready to go. It had all the elements to succeed, and clearly Disney had it well funded, so how did it come to be discontinued? Well, quite simply, it goes all the way back to the start. Since Disney were new to the Toys to Life scene, they underproduced all the 1.0 figures, which had quickly sold out within one year. Panicked at this, Disney then overcorrected and produced too many 2.0 figures. In all, they produced 2 million Hulk figures, but only 1 million were ever sold. 
Now, Disney claim that its decision to kill Infinity was more part of a general effort to outsource production of games so that they didn't have to do it themselves. But that doesn't make sense, as the game racked in more than half a billion dollars. Well, as it turns out, that was a bold-faced lie, as an internal report actually blames mismanagement behind the scenes and inflated sales expectations. On top of the Hulk problem, it transpires that investors insisted that they make figures of less popular characters, which hugely affected sales. As such, Disney didn't want to continue with the project whilst this was going on, despite plans for a Rogue One playset, Spider-Gwen and Peter Pan figures, and content to do with Coco, Pirates of the Caribbean, Cars 3 and more. I do find some irony here as the whole story just proves how Disney panicking at the first hurdle leads to its own demise. Instead of projecting sales of figures for its second year, they panicked and overproduced. In the end, instead of fixing the management issues, they panicked and shut the whole thing down. A considerable waste of money given that the next game was already mostly done. The shortest lived of the three, LEGO Dimensions is a stunning example of good in theory, bad in practice. If you want the short version of the story, the project was too ambitious. Looking deeper though, we can see the handling was sloppy from LEGO's end. Now, unlike the other two games, LEGO Dimensions was never intended to be an infinite game. It had a three year plan, by which point the game would wrap up and they'd move on to different things. Similar to Disney, LEGO suffered a miscalculation of production. The popular third party franchises, like Doctor Who, Portal and Scooby Doo, were frequently sold out. The first party content, like Ninjago however, were a bust. They were frequently overrepresented, and there were little in-game incentives to buy them. As such, there were many of these left on shelves. So what do you do when you can't clear stock? You discount it. But the problem with this was that it costs a lot to make a LEGO Dimensions pack, and as such, in order to stay competitive, LEGO didn't leave much of a profit margin from each pack. As such, discounting them essentially wiped out the profit margin entirely, and they couldn't really fix this as the whole appeal was that they were LEGO, where Skylanders and Infinity had a clear advantage as plastic users. This was replicated on a wide scale. For many sets, there had to be specialist pieces which cost more money. Therefore, if one set didn't sell, it risked the entire franchise and its bottom line. Knowing how precariously they were operating, LEGO decided to redouble their efforts and release a broader range of packs, notably tailored towards an adult audience, with franchises like E.T., The A-Team and Beetlejuice mixed with those for younger people like Adventure Time and Sonic. On top of this, they released story packs that you could put onto your portal and start a new campaign in a different world. They tailored these to what was culturally relevant in 2016. Now, bear in mind that by this point, Infinity had already died and Skylanders was on the way out. What do you think happened? Well, perhaps the Fantastic Beasts and Lego Batman movie sets were okay, but the third franchise they went with was Ghostbusters. Nothing wrong with that, but it was not the shot in the arm Lego were looking for. Bearing in mind this was the first of the story packs to come out, its mixed reception at the box office did not bode well for LEGO's sales, and despite even adding multiplayer arenas to the list of features a pack could get you, it was not good enough. But there's still an element to the story of LEGO Dimensions that's gone unnoticed as of yet, and that's its developer, TT Games. Just because people don't buy the packs, it doesn't mean you can't develop them, and sadly, whilst LEGO was failing on the shelf, each additional pack had to be coded and bug tested to make sure that they were working. In just two years of life, LEGO made 60 packs that came out in 10 waves, which all separately had to be sent off in updates to Xbox 360, Xbox One, PS3, PS4 and Wii U. Given the never ending list of stuff to do, bugs inevitably slipped through the cracks. It was all too much for them, even when they brought in satellite TT Fusion to help. Each franchise had different rules of inclusion, they all had to interact, which would never happen conventionally. They were even tasked with trying to make a camera that would scan any 5x5 creation you built into the game. That's a lot of work. Eventually, they switched their focus back to their normal LEGO game format, and thus the Toys to Life franchise was officially dead. It would be amiss of me not to mention the one exception to this whole story, Nintendo's Amiibo. 
why has that managed to outlive all the successful Toys to Life games? Well, Nintendo is smart about it. Amiibos don't add anything essential to your game. They also work across a multitude of games, Mario Kart to Smash Bros and so on. Really and truly, they are more collectibles than toys, and you don't even need to buy them. This means that they aren't draining consumers' wallets, and so that creates a lot of goodwill, maybe even to the point of buying them. It's genius. If you want a racing suit that looks like Captain Falcon, go ahead. By the way, why not fight against your amiibo in Smash Bros? The build quality is pretty good, and for the most part, they weren't competing for shelf space because, well, Nintendo aren't playing the same game. Others have tried the Toys to Life format, like Starlink, but they have all miserably failed. Because people have moved on. But the Toys to Life industry is a sad tale of each franchise failing, but not knowing that their competitors are too. It's a victim of its own oligopoly. The market was interdependent on what others did. One franchise brings out more toys, so you have to do the same. Eventually, they all got too big for their boots because they were scared of each other. Who knows, maybe if one had pulled out earlier, we'd still be looking at Toys to Life games. Whatever happens, let that be an example to game developers. You can be the pioneer, but you need a plan. Otherwise, your idea is just a drop in the ocean. I want to thank you all so much for watching this video. The channel has been through an insane growth since the last one. I wasn't even planning on making videos again, but just with numbers like this, there was no way I could let you guys down. So thank you so much for watching. I hope that was entertaining. I was certainly interested because I was just looking back at my old videos thinking, what happened to Toys to Life? And now we know. So hopefully I'm going to keep uploading every week, once a week. Um, and hopefully we'll keep growing in numbers. Can we hit 200 soon? I hope we can. But for now, please like and subscribe. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. This is Agent B721, signing out. Peace.